There are three key qualities that the next Louisville men's basketball coach should have. We'll identify those on today's episode of the Locked On Louisville podcast. Stay tuned. You are Locked On Louisville, your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome into another episode of the Locked On Louisville Podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Pence. Today's episode brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Terms and conditions apply. And as always, I want to personally thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, the Locked On Mobile podcast is free on all streaming services, five days a week, your team, every day. On today's episode of the show, we are identifying the three key qualities that the next Louisville men's basketball coach should have. We'll start out with style of play, where we discuss X's and O's, um, adjustments, etc., roster management in terms of recruiting and player development. And we'll also talk about, at the end of the show, understanding the job and why that's key um, for the next coach. Obviously, if you are watching this on video, you see the bland background again. Uh, I feel like I am responsible or uh, or I am required, I, I should say, to apologize to you all for not having a backdrop. Again, I changed recording spaces in my house because of connection issues. So there's only my face and a gray um wallpaper paint and the audio is not the greatest either working to um fix both of those the backdrop is being put into motion and working to fix some sound issues as well so do want to apologize for your uh, lack of viewing and um listening convenience so forgive me for that but the cardinals have ended the regular season eight wins this year um Unofficially, Kenny is not gone yet, but the writing is on the wall that the pain era of Louisville basketball will be over within you know the next couple of days, potentially as soon as Sunday, as soon as tomorrow. This is being recorded on Saturday evening, so nothing is official yet. We are coming out with this episode, um, not knowing what is you know, going to happen in the next 24 to 48 hours. So if the news breaks, understand that this is being recorded on Saturday. There are some rumors that, you know, we might get some news on Sunday or it could be as long as the end of the ACC tournament um, appearances for the Cardinals. They will start conference tournament play Tuesday afternoon, 430 against the Miami Hurricanes. So we're operating under the assumption that it's going to happen soon, but we just don't know when. But Let's get into the qualities. There's two qualities I think are at the forefront. Three make up the nucleus. The first one is style of play. And I think that, um, you know, since Rick Patino was let go, the Cardinals have not had a very, um, a very effective style of play on both ends of the court. Now, Rick Patino's offenses were never really known for being prolific um, overall, but they were so good defensively that you could mask some of those offensive inefficiencies. Some of those Patino offenses weren't really all that great whatsoever. But Chris Mack's team um, had the pack line defense, which I, I know many fans weren't truly on board with. And then offensively, um, nothing truly special. Kenny Payne's team, um, I, I don't think that the majority of the fan base really ever knew what the team was trying to do on either offense or defense. There was a lot of isolation basketball on the offensive end and defensively, just a lot of standing around and watching. Um, so there were reports that he wanted to run an NBA offense with college players, sort of like a Calipari offense um, and call Calipari style. It doesn't utilize zone defense. Um, but I think that that's at the forefront is you want a coach that brings, I'm not necessarily worried so much as bringing an exciting brand of basketball to this university. I just want an effective style of play. And for me, there's like the term style of play and then X's and O's right under it. And then it's like a, a complex root system of a couple different things. Um, Number one is adaptability. 
something that I want to see from the next head coach is, okay, what really constitutes um, the difference between a good and a great coach, a great coach and an elite coach is his ability to shift his playing style and his play calls, his, X and o, his X's and O's around a, a specific team year in, year out. So based upon the player personnel, a coach is then able to tweak his style of play to fit the personnel that he has on the roster. Something that I don't necessarily think has been a strength for this program over the past five to six years. Um, that's something that I'm looking forward to is the adaptability of the coach. Um, we've seen countless coaches in college basketball go away from their um, bread and butter when it comes to how they like to run their offense, their defensive tendencies to sort of be tailor made to their roster. And it's extremely important considering that roster turnover is at an all time high in college sports in general because of the transfer portal, the one time or really almost unlimited time transfers at this point. But the adaptability is going to be key in this era of uh, not only college basketball, but college sports as a whole. And even if there wasn't a transfer portal like there is now, I still think that a coach that's able to trust his um, trust his uh, ability to teach the team the ways in which he wants them to play, and they're able to buy into the system. Obviously, we want a coach whose system will be able to be implemented here and result into wins because at the end of the day, the main quality is a guy that's going to bring wins back to this program a guy that's going to get the Cardinals to the NCAA tournament to get to those Sweet 16s, get to the Final Four, get to the National Championship, bring some more championships to this university. That's the end goal. And um, I think that there are a couple coaches that have been talked about that possess that ability or that ceiling to get to a National Championship, and we'll see which way Athletic Director Josh Hurd wants to go. So, uh, adaptability is is one thing. I also think that in-game adjustments are another. And being able to see that, okay, look, I'm, I'm going to use uh, Jeff Brom as an example here. And obviously we're comparing apples to oranges with basketball and football, but the merit remains the same is that in that Georgia Tech game, Louisville struggled in the second quarter. Things weren't going the way they should. And what happened? They made adjustments just like that. So in the second half, they came out and they roared out to the lead and didn't look back. Louisville against Syracuse, 2013 Big East Championship. Cardinals go down by double digits against a very good Jim Beheim coach team. They make some adjustments and boom, they're able to come back. Now these are some pretty solid teams, but the ability to make adjustments based upon what's not working. If something's not working, don't keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's insanity. That's literally the definition in the dictionary of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And if it's working, don't go away from it. I feel like a couple of times over the past two years, Wolves had a hot hand on offense and it's like they have a good stretch and boom, they're out of the game. And the substitutions are another part of in-game adjustments, being able to put the right personnel on the court at the right time one of the um, one of my main questions regarding the Kenny Payne era was what's the substitution pattern? What is the rhyme or reason behind why he's putting certain players into the game? Never felt like we really got a rhythm. I understand injuries came into play, but I mean, you have to get to a, a point to where there's a little bit of consistency, and it felt like there really never was throughout the 24 months that he was the head coach. So you have adaptability. You have the ability to make adjustments. The third part of style of play in X's and O's is game planning. Uh, being able to create a game plan, an effective game plan, I might add, for certain opponents. Um, being prepared to play certain opponents. Not only in the Kenny Payne era, but the Chris Mack era as well. The Cardinals looked like they just didn't scout the team whatsoever. Now, obviously, I'm being an armchair quarterback at this point, and not really in that film room. And I'm not saying that they didn't do any scouting, but the level of play and how caught off guard they were 
just makes things a little questionable. I, I go back to Kenny Payne's comment about, well, my Mike Woodson tricked him by playing zone. And, and that's what I'm talking about is understanding um, the team that you're playing, knowing the coach on the other side of the sidelines and being prepared for the adjustments that they're going to make. I think that all three of those qualities that fall under the blanket of style and play and X's and O's um, are, are something that our next head basketball coach should be able to do. I'm not saying they have to be Rick Patino because there's only one Rick Patino, but having a coach that's able to do that, I think is half the battle of getting you back to the NCAA tournament on a perennial basis. The other half, in my opinion, is roster management as it relates to recruiting and player development. It is a give and take. It's not as cut and dry as it seems. We'll explain why here momentarily after we talk about our friends over at Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. My favorite thing is that Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as my favorite, the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on fire TV. Cardinal fans, thanks again for tuning into this weekend edition of the Locked On Louisville podcast. Just a reminder, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports streaming, the national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today, now available on the free tire, free Fire TV channels app. I fumbled my way through there. Um, but one thing that Louisville cannot do is fumble this men's basketball coaching search. It is the most Important hire in Louisville men's basketball history. We're going to talk about that on um, a future episode of the show coming up soon. Now, we just discussed why X's and O's style of play was sort of 1A, 1B in terms of the qualities that you need the next Cardinals head coach to have. What's number two? Well, if you're listening literally like 45 seconds ago, you would know that it is roster management and like style of play. It is a complex uh, system of thoughts underneath that. It starts out with recruiting, both high school and transfer portal. And I know that there have been a handful of teams that really, really do well with getting high school players and developing them and creating their winning culture that way. For other teams like your Blue Blood programs, it is recruiting the best of the best, supplementing via the transfer portal and contending in that nature. And then there are the programs like Arkansas, like um, I'm trying to go off the top of my head, who else um, fits this mold, but Arkansas for certain that completely overhauls the roster via the transfer portal and is tasked with, you know, creating that chemistry and camaraderie on the court. So regardless of who the next head coach is and what his method is in terms of recruiting and developing a roster, I think you need to have a healthy balance, truthfully, ideally of all three, your highly rated guys, your players that you brought in that might be a little bit lower rated, but they are developmental guys, veterans that can help the team and players that you can supplement in or that, that you can add into the equation via the transfer portal. And I'm looking for a coach that knows sort of his bread and butter approach, whether it is whatever one of those three. I think that regardless of the method, it's putting together a solid roster on the court. Something that roster management has been a struggle really since the Patino days. 
And I say the Patino days like they weren't that or they were quite a long time ago. But listen, I mean, he got fired in 2017. We are pretty much seven years from the last time that Rick Patino was on the Cardinal sideline. The 2016-17 season was his last year. We are seven years since then in roster construction. I feel like Mac had some decent rosters, I will say. But it's it's kind of gone downhill since then. So, personally for me, I, you don't have to get to a situation to where you bring in top three classes every year. I know that Louisville has been a program historically that – brings in a top prospect here and there, but their bread and butter is the high-end, mid-end, four-star level guys, maybe low four-stars that can come here and develop your two-year players, your four-year players, and supplementing via the transfer portal lately. And I think that you're probably going to see a coach come into the Cardinals program and not be like a Duke or a Kentucky, but you know you can be – like a, I don't even know who you would really compare it to. I'm going to say Baylor, not just because Scott Drew is a presumed candidate, but Baylor is sort of like the recruiting, um, it's like the recruiting highlight or the recruiting expectation and standard that I would love for Louisville to be able to adopt. You get your one five-star a class, maybe two, but some higher rated guys. Uh, you have some players that are developmental pieces, and then you also go out and you you do well in the transfer portal. And I think that that's key. So you have a mixture of all three, and it's going to be on the next head coach to find sort of where the the healthy middle is, where the median is, where all three of those come together in the in the Venn diagram, and you can create your roster. So recruiting is one thing for me. Louisville is a place that you know solid NIL foundation that we found out from you know. Zach Soskin and company, Eric Crawford has said, you know, it, it's being said that Louisville doesn't have as much NIL for basketball. That is just not true. And it's shown via football. We're seeing that. And Zach Soskin said, you know what, that's not true for basketball. Either there is an NIL foundation and you should be able to recruit because recruiting these days is essentially all about NIL. I hate to say it, but that is what it is. Are you going to maximize your value to a program monetarily? So. Louisville should be able to contend in the game with almost any NIL collective out there and be able to land some top players via the portal, via the recruiting class. But it's not only that. It's all about, you know, roster management in terms of recruiting, but trusting your scouting and being able to scout those four-star guys that are able to come in and, um, you know, make an impact at some point in their college career. You can bring in four-star guys. But if you're not able to develop them or, you know, you're, you find a player that's not as good as his ranking, it really doesn't matter. Player development is sort of the 1B of the roster management um, quality. The guys you bring in, I understand some five-star guys are going to go to the NBA after one year. Not really much developing you can have there. Same with portal players. If you get a guy who's a grad transfer and he's only going to be here for one year, it's hard to really develop that player. In that case, it's all about making sure that that player is able to understand and execute your system, what you're wanting to do on the court, and being able to um, you know, uh, transform the X's and O's on paper to success on the court and ultimately wins. But we're talking about the development of the recruits that you bring in. And I think Kenny Payne, despite having some issues, a good amount of issues in his head coaching tenure, one thing that I like was how he developed Brendan Huntley Hatfield. Huntley Hatfield in his first season with the Cardinals, not all that great. Lacked aggression. Uh, didn't seem like he had an idea of what his role was on offense. In year two, he bounces back. He was an all ACC level player. Unfortunately, eight wins sort of overshadowed how good he was because he was one of the best big men in the ACC. So, but that should be the norm. You want to have um, a coach that is able to take a guy who might be a mid to low level four star guy, a three star guy that you believe in the talent and the potential, and he might not play right away year one. But you're getting to a situation to where 
year two, year three, he's starting to increase his production because you're developing that skill set, um, you know, on the court for these players. So that is one thing for me is, yes, can you recruit? That's great. But there is a part two to this question. Can you develop the guys that you recruit? Can you get them to buy into your system and play together? All very, very important things to focus on when it comes to roster management. 1A, 1B, it's style of play and it's roster management. But there is a number three, which I think is slotted right at number two. It forms the, the three quality nucleus that you're looking for in the next head coach. And it is what I call understanding the job. We're going to explain what exactly I mean by that here momentarily after we talk about our friends and the title sponsor of the show, LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. It's not just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. And it does that all while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. So don't waste any more time. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. We are breezing through this um late Saturday night, depending on when you listen to this early Sunday morning uh, episode of the Lockdown Global Podcast, identifying the key qualities the next global men's basketball coach should have. Number 1A, or 1A, style of play. 1B, roster, de- roster, not roster development, roster management, recruiting and player development. Number three is what I like to call understanding the job. In that, you have PR, you have relating to the fan base. And three, I think that most global fans would agree that you should understand the magnitude of the job that you have and the expectations that come with it. Especially what I just said. I feel like the expectations of global basketball, the goalpost keeps moving and moving on it. Let's be completely clear as to what the expectations are here at the University of Louisville. It is at the very, very least making the NCAA tournament. Miss me with all the excuses. I don't care. Make the NCAA tournament. It doesn't matter who the head coach is. We talk about, well, the next head coach that comes in, guess what? You're one. He's going to be expected to make the NCAA tournament. It, it's different if this was like 2014 versus 2024, where that one-time transfer rule is not in place, where you can't essentially flip a college roster overnight in just a couple months. You can do that now. There's no excuse to not make the NCAA tournament. Oh, well, Louisville's just supposed to they were supposed to get to 12 wins in year two i'm not telling fans how to fan i just think that is an insult to this program if you suggest that anything less than making the ncaa tournament is the expectation in my opinion you're suggesting that Louisville isn't a blue blood level program and i think that they are so understanding the expectations It's not just getting to the NCAA tournament, but the past couple of years it has been because things have been so rough. It's getting to the NCAA tournament, and then it's getting to that second weekend, contending for championships. That is the ultimate expectation. You bring a coach here to win championships. So understanding the job is understanding the expectations that come with it. I also feel like the fan base felt sort of alienated from um, the program over the past couple of years. Now, I'm not saying that Kenny Payne had to broadcast everything in terms of recruiting, but up until Carter Knox and Jason Sanon, we didn't hear anything about 2024 recruiting. They had a lone commit, TJ Robinson, and it's sort of been radio silence. We haven't understood if he's going to sign or not. I would expect that he's probably not going to, but they're going to be a head coaching change. But we didn't really hear anything. It felt like the coaching staff and the fan base were on different wavelengths. And, um, you know, we felt like the 
coach didn't necessarily understand. Um, it's like both parties didn't really understand each other. It's really hard for me to kind of verbalize what I'm trying to say, but I feel like you can kind of get the gist of what I'm trying to convey here is that I feel like the coaching staff and the fan base never really understood each other. And it was highlighted by the press conferences. And were some things that Kenny Payne said taken out of context or were they amplified too much? Well, of course, of course. That's sort of society today is that we make things way more complicated than they are and we make something out of nothing. But there were plenty of times uh, where Kenny Payne said some stuff and the fan base and the media were just like, huh? What Did he say that? Did he truly say that? I understand that that sometimes might not necessarily be what he meant. And I'm, you know, giving him the benefit of the doubt, you know, more often than not. But there's some things it's like you hear and it's like, OK, um, you know, going back to the well, John Calipari, like saying John Calipari wants to blow us out and I just want to beat them by one. You know, it felt like the fan base didn't really like that. Um, so a PR, the PR level of understanding this job, you know, Louisville basketball, when it is at its best, controls the city. This is a college town. This is a college basketball town. No disrespect to Jeff Brown because it's starting to become a football town, too. This is historically a college basketball town built around its Louisville Cardinals program. And it's the coach has sort of, in my opinion, a responsibility to – you know, relate and connect with the fan base. Say what you will about, you know, the play on the court. One thing Chris Mack did really well was he understood this fan base. He related with this fan base ever since that first Louisville Live. He came out in the the Louisville Blazer, the, the leather jacket blazer. Um, and, you know, just he just got it. He just understood. And I know that that might nece not necessarily be the most important thing, but I think that it goes a long way with gaining some favor with this fan base because there's a couple names that have been floated out there that if they were hired, they might be good options for the university that could ultimately help Louisville win a national championship. But right away, they're not going to be looked at as ex expiring, inspiring, exciting hires. So it's going to be on that coach to be able to relate to the fan base, depending on who the hire is. I think right now we're just going to be speculating until – about 48 hires before that hire is made. And it's like, oh, wow, either he came out of nowhere or he was that guy we were focusing on in general. But it's going to be a long couple of weeks. Buckle up, Louisville fans. Um, try not to get too high. Try not to get too low. Don't believe everything you read. There's going to be a lot of clickbait. There are going to be coaches that are going to use this job opening to get paid. That's the magnitude of this job. There's going to be people with legit interest. There's going to be some smoke screens. All that I can advise you to do is sit back and do what you can to relax. Learn about the candidates. Read into their coaching styles. Read into their coaching backgrounds. Where did they come from? How did they rise to the level that they are now? Don't just write off a candidate because of groupthink. Do your own research and do a dive into the, a coaching candidate and see whether or not you feel like they are going to be the right fit or not. Don't fall into groupthink. I think that that is a huge phenomenon in society that uh, we, you know, fall victim to. So do your own research. Um, but most importantly, understand that everyone's going to have different opinions. It's time to stop being so um, divided on everything. Let's come together, even though we might disagree, let's come together and, and rebuild this program. That's going to wrap up this episode of the show. I'm not sure what the hell is going to happen on Sunday. This episode ended 1141 p.m. Eastern Daylight Standard Time. I don't know what's going to happen Sunday. But what I will know is that, in my opinion, Josh Hurd is going to bring this program back. We'll see you back here 